great. Can you tell us how you got interested in clinical psychology? Yeah, sure. Uh, my father was a clinical psychologist, and by all accounts, uh, quite good. The, um, I went home, uh, town I grew up in last year uh, uh, for my second 25-year high school reunion, and I had a couple of friends come up to me who uh, he tend to specialize in working with troubled teens who indicated how much they appreciated the work. I hadn't realized that, uh, of course, they were seeing him at the time, but in retrospect, it, it made sense. Uh, that being said, I went off to college intent that the one thing I would not become was a clinical psychologist. The, uh, uh, I'm very fond of him, but the bulk of his practice was working with people uh, who worked in family businesses. It seemed like that was not a good uh, Good route to go. I thought I'd go into at first journalism and then law, and I was, they didn't have a pre-law course where I went here in, in town at GW, so I uh, uh, took a lot of psychology courses to think I'd be a, a, a criminal defense lawyer or criminal or something along that line, and uh, got interested in the psychology classes, and by the time in my senior year, and I was applying to law schools, I'd taken the LSATs, and I'm uh, uh, middle of that, uh, that cold uh, spring, uh, sending off applications, I thought, this is not what I want to do, so I made a change, made a pivot, and decided I'd go into psychology. The graduate programs in psychology I applied to were not impressed. And uh, uh, so the first year I applied to 10 get in at any. The second year I got a job in a community mental health center, working as a therapist, totally out of my league and totally unprepared for any of that, but it was all great, good fun. And the second year I applied to 50 places, got into two, and uh, I've never, I've never uh, turned back, never looked back on that. Yeah. Looking back, who were the most important influences on your career? Again, my father was, was absolutely uh, terrific. He always set aside a day a week uh, to do essentially community work, and uh, he set up a center for uh, uh, parents with children with cerebral palsy in town, set up a uh, uh, program for people who are going through uh, dialysis for kidney problems. In later years, he set up, uh, helped set up a place called the Covor Center in uh, Chicago for victims of, uh, of uh, torture, mostly uh, South American, Middle Eastern, who are being tortured by people trained by our CIA. So it was a, a great, great role model to follow. Uh, and then in terms of real influence on me, Tim Beck, of course, is absolutely major. Things really took off for me when I uh, uh, went out of my way to get up to Philadelphia to work with him. And I was just an absolute total fan uh, from, from day one. Uh, Marty Sullivan was very important in my training. My wife went up and then girlfriend wife went up and worked with Marty at the same time. And I uh, learned from Marty Sullivan how to ask interesting questions. And Jerry Clareman, the uh, uh, great uh, uh, research psychiatrist, had a lot to do with uh, helping me develop an interest in good uh, research methodology, the notion of any uh, treatment be tested. So really, those, those four folks, my father, Tim, uh, Marty, and, and Jerry Clareman. Yeah. And what started your interest specifically in cognitive behavioral treatments? Yeah, well, I, I was, uh, again, I got very interested in Tim Beck's work, more his work on depression. Depression has always been the uh, prime interest for me and mover. And when I went up to Philadelphia, it wasn't with the intent uh, they didn't know about cognitive therapy then or very little about it, but I was, uh, wanted to work on depression. And uh, when I got up there, <coughs> uh, Tim didn't know who I was, and uh, uh, it took a little while to uh, work my way into their group. Actually, I remember June, I had to drive up to uh, Society for Psychotherapy Research up in uh, Boston at a conference because we saw he was going to be talking there, and we ended up going up there, got to know some of the people in this group, particularly Marika Kovacs, who was marvelous. Marika was Hungarian, wanted to go back for two weeks vacation that summer. Uh, Tim only wanted to go back for one, so I said, look, I would help out. I'm a psychologist. I could do the interviewing for her while she's gone, and it uh, won't cost you anything. And I uh, spent the next two weeks making myself absolutely indispensable, and within a couple of months, we worked out something that turned out to be my clinical internship. And, Marvelous. So, in the midst of that, they were they were doing the what turned out to be what ended up being the Rush All trial. And at that point, there were no psychological interventions that could hold their own with medications. And the Rush All trial, we uh, not only did as well as the medications, we beat the medications short term. Turns out it's only because we did a bad job with the medications, but uh, we also got indications of a long term enduring effect. And uh, I got hooked, and it's been off to the races with that ever since. Incredible. So you've had a long career. What would you say are your most important contributions to research and practice? Yeah, uh, the thing I've been most interested and invested in, uh, depression is a, uh, is a recurrent disorder. Any given episode tends to clear up on its own, but people who ever get depressed are about three to five times greater risk of getting depressed again in the future. So we, we think of this being a, uh, an episodic recurrent disorder. Nowadays, 30 years into uh, heavy use of psychiatric medications, we think of it as a chronically recurrent disorder, possibly because the medications are uh, actually uh, suppressing symptoms at the expense of prolonging the episode. But the thing we've always had, the thing I've always been interested in is the notion that uh, psychological interventions could uh, reduce subsequent risk. 
if somebody, uh, the way we've always done cognitive therapy is not just to do the therapy with patients, but to teach them how to do the therapy for themselves. We want to try to uh, uh, teach skills in the process. And uh, gee, from the first trial on, from the Rush Hill trial, the, the only thing I contributed there was the notion that we ought to be following those folks up, and we did, and we got device indication that uh, we cut risk in half. Uh, went off to Minnesota in the first trial I did there with Rob DeRubis. Again, we cut risk in half relative to prior medications, and uh, there are eight studies in the literature that have looked at prior cognitive therapy versus prior medication, four of them ours, and, uh, and all four of those we cut risk by about half. And, uh, Three other studies in the literature show about the same thing as only one outlier, so I think it's a very robust finding. And uh, it just, it, it, again, for, for a disorder like depression, it's important to be able to get folks better, but it's every bit as almost as important to be able to keep them well after that. And we think uh, we have evidence in CBT that you can. So that's, I think, the primary thing that I've done. What recent findings about psychopathology and mental health are likely to have the greatest impact on future research and practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two things. Uh, my long-term friend and colleague, uh, Rob DeRubis, uh, Rob and I started off back at the Minnesota together and really kind of uh, did a lot of virt virtually, uh, virtually everything I've done, I've done in conjunction with Rob and the best things I've done in conjunction with Rob. But what he's done now is probably the best thing he's done is uh, to identify the way that we can use treatment, pre-treatment characteristics to generate treatment selection algorithms to identify who responds best to a given intervention. Uh, the study before last that we did, we're looking at uh, more severely depressed patients, placebo-controlled uh, comparison to medication. We found, number one, that uh, cognitive therapy can hold its own very nicely vis-a-vis -vis medications and both be pill placebo, but in that larger sample, about a quarter of the patients should have gotten medication to, at the, from the beginning. They would have done better on medications, about half did, half didn't because of the randomization. About a quarter of the patients should have gotten cognitive therapy, about half did, half didn't, and the difference between people getting what they should have gotten and what they actually ended up getting was as large as the pill placebo difference. And what that means is uh, Rob can apply those kinds of uh, treatment selection algorithms uh, to baseline uh, pre-treatment characteristics and tell you what's the best treatment for a given individual. And doing that is going to uh, be uh, about as large as specific, uh, specific effect we get from the medications. Now what that means is we can do a better, we can, we can enhance the outcomes we get from our clinical practice before we even change the practice, uh, the, the interventions at all. So just by getting the right treatment to a given person, it's the old Gordon Paul uh, uh, dream of getting, uh, finding the right, the optimal treatment for a given individual. Uh, in addition to that, because uh, if we're getting specific effects, and those are the folks we're probably getting specific effects for, we don't know who in advance is going to do that. Those people that show a specific effect are the ones for whom the mechanisms ought to be operating. So we can use those algorithms to identify the subsets of patients who ought to be the ones showing the change in the underlying purported mechanism. So we can do our, make our tests of uh, mediation even more powerful, and that will be able to improve the treatments. That's, I think, one of the two most important things. The other thing, my uh, and long-term uh, uh, girlfriend, now wife, Judy Garber, uh, worked with Marty Seligman, did some marvelous prevention research, first uh, longitudinal research. And what she and her colleagues have found is that you can identify kids, adolescents, who are at risk for getting depressed by virtue of the fact they have depressed parents. The odds can go up to them to about three to five times greater risk. And if you do something that's quite closely related to cognitive behavioral interventions, uh, you cut that risk in about half. If the parents aren't currently depressed, parents are currently depressed, you've got a problem and you lose the effect. But again, we've got evidence that you can do uh, prevention and uh, offset the, uh, off, offset. You, you, can, you can nullify the risk from day one for kids going into adolescence, and that I think is the other picture that we've got. What do you believe are the biggest challenges facing clinical science at this time? Uh, two things, number one is, uh, uh, is getting folks to use the things that we know work. Uh, David Clark uh, tells the marvelous anecdote how he spent 20 years developing really absolutely first-rate uh, interventions for anxiety. His wife, Anka Ehlers, same thing for PTSD. And he was standing in line one time, I was in a green room waiting to go on, and he was there with a fellow named Richard Laird, Lord Laird, the uh, marvelous healthcare economist. And Laird asked him what he did, and David told him, and uh, Laird said, do these things work? And David said, yes, they do. And Laird said, do people use them? He said, no, they don't. And they realized that um, that we, we, have, we have great technologies that most folks don't use. Uh, so they then uh, talked further and they ended up uh, generating a thing called IAP, Increasing Access to psycho Psychological Treatments. I think I have that right. And uh, made the case not to the professional organizations in England, but to the uh, uh, people that run the National uh, Health Service, that people have to pay for uh, uh, treatments and, and disabilities, that they could, uh, they could save the government money by getting effective treatments out there. And they did, and they have, and it's been an absolutely marvelous program. So I think they've got one model of how to actually uh, get clinicians using effective interventions. Um, 
at NIMH they have a saying that you can't herd H-E-R-D cats, but you can move their food, and you can move the reimbursements, clinicians will follow. Um, in the States, uh, we did a nice, APA did a nice clinical practice guideline, the first one on PTSD, and what it basically recommended was either exposure or exposure or exposure, and of course most clinicians in this country do not do exposure, they're afraid of it, and if they do do it, it's in the context of EMDR, it gives them something to do with their hands to relieve their own anxiety. Uh, but gee, the, uh, uh, somebody like Anke Ehlers does some really marvelous kind of work along that area, and uh, uh, there are things that, it, again, we, we have a better sense as to what can be done uh, than actually gets implemented, largely because people do what they were trained to do, and uh, change in uh, clinical practice is largely generational, but uh, if we get the good clinical practice guidelines, like what they have in the UK, uh, people coming through graduate training now will learn how to do those things, it'll be second nature to them, and uh, we'll, we'll get better. Fit, we'll get greater accessibility. The one other thing I'll mention, I've been working with uh, Vikram Patel, a marvelous uh, research psychiatrist, uh, uh, was at the uh, uh, London School of uh, Health and Trop uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, now moved to Harvard, and Vikram is taking uh, the best of uh, best of the world-class interventions into uh, low and middle income countries, India for example, and what Vikram's work has shown is that you can take people who are not professionals, what they call task shifting, you can take people who are not professionals, mostly uh, uh, young high school graduates, teach them how to do things like behavioral activation, they did a culturally adapted version called HAP, and you get good results in rural uh, India, places that you couldn't get close to a mental health professional, and uh, again, it's it's. Most folks in the world don't have access to anything, much less empirically supported interventions. And uh, gee, the, uh, between the uh, um, between the treatment selection algorithms to identify, between the kind of programs that people like David uh, Clark and Richard Lair and Anka Ehlers are developing, and between the uh, task shifting, I think we can do a much better job of getting things that really work out in front of people. So how can we do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians? Well, again, I think change is mostly generational. And most clinicians I know are marvelous people who do great, uh, great kinds of work. They may or may not be willing to uh, uh, change what they do in practice. Uh, having good CE, uh, good continuum education, good uh, opportunities for training is, is quite important. Chris Fairburn is doing some great work uh, in terms of developing um, training tapes that people can use. He's got a set up right now for uh, uh, cognitive behavior therapy for eating disorders. He's also got a set that Christopher Martell helped with on behavioral activation. Uh, David Clark and Anki Ehlers at Oxford have a terrific set of training vignettes for um, uh, helping uh, therapists learn how to do what they do for social anxiety and for PTSD. I've, I've watched a number of them in, in my classes, six or seven minute vignettes to show exactly how to proceed. I think those are marvelous opportunities for both uh, folks going into training and for folks who are already trained to pick up on those kinds of things. So that we're, we're getting better at this kind of thing. Any specific changes you'd want to see in graduate teaching and training in psychology? Well, I like the I like the notion of uh, focusing on those things. We have evidence that work. It's not to say we don't need to develop even better interventions. We do, uh, but uh, any graduate program that emphasizes uh, empirically supported treatments, but especially the principles that underlie, and um, you, there, there, it's 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 popular nowadays to talk about uh, integrated uh, protocols, etc. And I think that's great. But basically, if you teach the basic underlying principles, um, the, the technologies flow from those principles and. Uh, Anything that focuses on teaching the basic principles, uh, uh, basic operant, uh, uh, Pavlovian, cognitive, other kinds of principles is going to be great, and the more we do that, the better. How do you see CBT evolving in the next 10 years? Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, uh, it's going to have to be uh, outsourced, and uh, uh, there's so many people in the world in, in, uh, that would benefit from interventions that don't get a shot at that. Uh, the behavior, more purely behavioral approaches are easier to disseminate, easier to teach, because there are just fewer moving parts. doesn't mean you can't teach uh, uh, the uh, additional cognitive elements as well. I think uh, 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 Atif uh, uh, Ran in, in Pakistan has done that, other folks have done that. So anything that, uh, anything that increases access to training, supervision, and uh, uh, good, good, good feedback on those kind of interventions is going to be good. And we're, pushing that on the worldwide level. I think the thing that Anka and, and uh, uh, Ehlers and David Clark have at Oxford is marvelous training vignette. Chris Verbun's stuff is great as well. Uh, Vikram is, uh, uh, Patel is developing some really interesting internet training devices uh, in India. Most of that's in Hindi, so it uh, may or may not be accessible to audiences here, but a lot more people speak Hindi than speak English, so uh, that's going to be good as well. Uh, uh, overall, the, the overall level of what's going on in the field is just, it, it's hot, better than anything I've seen at any time in my career. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we're clearly on an upward spiral.
any areas or issues you feel CBT needs to address more in the future? Sure. Uh, as well, we can do really good things, and uh, for non-psychotic uh, patients, we can, uh, we're every bit as efficacious as medications and usually have longer-lasting, more enduring effects. Still, in all, um, uh, about one person in three completes treatment, gets well, and stays well for at least a year. I remember telling uh, uh, well, my mother-in-law one time at a dinner party years ago for that, she said, for that, you get paid. Uh, I mean, as, as well as we can do, there's so many more people we haven't been able to crack yet. Christopher... Uh, Fair, Chris Fairburn has a marvelous study uh, that they did in Copenhagen, the, a group of dynamic uh, uh, therapists at a center that was focused around dynamic therapy, approached him about doing a trial. Uh, they did typically a two-year intervention for people with eating disorders, and they asked Chris how much time he needs, about 20 weeks. And I said, 20 weeks, we do two years. Okay, you do two years, I'll do 20 weeks. And you got 50% uh, response uh, rate with very little relapse at all. Uh, within 20 weeks, that held over the next two years. By the end of two years, the folks with the dynamic approach were still having trouble breaking 20%. Now that's marvelous, the differential is huge. At the same time, half the folks they started in the CBT, uh, the best we know how to do, didn't respond. So uh, we, we can do better than most other interventions. Uh, we certainly have uh, enduring effects that you don't find from medications, and yet all that being said, we're about halfway to where we wanna be. And our final question, how has membership in ABCT impacted your career? Oh, it's, it's my home uh, institution, home organization. First, second conference I ever went to. First one was SPR, that's where I met Tim Beck, but uh, uh, ABCT after that, I've not missed an ABT since, and uh, this, this is what I identify with. It's uh, the absolutely marvelous organization that I think uh, has done a great deal of good for the world and will continue to do that. Dr. Holland, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, thanks.